interest on their mounting debts and gradually fall under the control of the faceless bureaucrats of the world central bank. As the worldwide depression worsens and spreads, this will give the world central bank the power of economic life and death over these nations. It will decide which nations will be permitted to receive further loans and which nations will starve. Despite all the rhetoric about development and the alleviation of poverty, the result is a steady transfer of wealth from the debtor nations to the money changers central banks which control the IMF and the World Bank. For example, in 1992, the third world debtor nations which borrowed from the World Bank paid $198 million more to the central banks of the developed nations for World Bank funded purposes than they received from the World Bank. All this increases their permanent debt in exchange for temporary relief of poverty caused by prior borrowings. Already these repayments exceed the amount of the new loans. By 1992, Africa's external debt had reached $290 billion, two and a half times greater than in 1980, resulting in skyrocketing infant mortality rates and unemployment, deterioration of schools, housing, and the general health of the people. The entire world faces the immeasurable suffering already destroying the third world and now Japan, all for the benefit of the money changers. As one prominent Brazilian politician put it, The Third World War has already started. It is a silent war, not for that reason any less sinister. The war is tearing down Brazil, Latin America, and practically all the Third World. Instead of soldiers dying, there are children. It is a war over the Third World debt, one which has as its main weapon interest, a weapon more deadly than the atom bomb, more shattering than a laser beam. Although it would be absurd to ignore the pivotal role played by influential families such as the Rothschilds, the Warburgs, the Schiffs, the Morgans, and the Rockefellers in any review of the history of central banking and fractional banking, keep in mind by now, central banks and the large commercial banks are up to three centuries old and deeply entrenched in the economic life of many nations. These banks are no longer dependent on clever individuals such as a Nathan Rothschild. Years ago, the question of ownership was important but no longer. For example, both the Bank of England and the Bank of France were nationalized after World War II and nothing changed, nothing at all. They endure and continue to grow, now protected by numerous laws, paid politicians, and mortgaged media, untouched by the changing of generations. Three centuries have given them an aura of respectability. The old school tie is now worn by the sixth generation son, who's been raised in a system that he may never question as he is named to serve on the governing boards of countless philanthropic organizations. To focus attention today on individuals or families, or to attempt to sort out the current holders of power serves little useful purpose and would be a distraction from the cure. The problem is far bigger than that. It is the corrupt banking system that was and is being used to consolidate vast wealth into fewer and fewer hands that is our current economic problem. Change the names of the main players now and the problem will neither go away nor even miss a beat. Likewise, among the hordes of bureaucrats working in the World Bank, central banks, and international banks, only a tiny fraction have any idea of what's really going on. No doubt they'd be horrified to learn that their work is contributing to the terrible impoverishment and gradual enslavement of mankind to a few incredibly rich plutocrats. So really, there's no use in emphasizing the role of individuals anymore. And the problem even transcends the normal spectrum of political right and left. Both communism and socialism, as well as monopoly capitalism, have been used by the money changers. Today, 
They profit from either side of the new political spectrum. The big government welfare state on the so-called left wing versus the neoconservative laissez-faire capitalists who want big government totally out of their lives on the right wing. Either way, the bankers win. Monetary reform is the most important political issue facing this nation. That clarified, let's proceed to the conclusions in the spirit Lincoln declared, with malice towards none, with charity towards all. At the start of this video, we ask a number of troubling questions. Let's be sure we've answered them. What's going on in America today? Why are we over our heads in debt? Why can't the politicians bring debt under control? Why are we over our heads in debt? Because we're laboring under a debt money system that is designed and controlled by private bankers. Now, some will argue that the Federal Reserve System is a quasi-governmental agency. But the President appoints only two of the seven members of the Federal Reserve Board of Governors every four years. And he appoints them to 14-year terms, far longer than his own. The Senate does confirm those appointments, but the whole truth is that the President wouldn't dare appoint anyone to that board of whom Wall Street does not approve. Of course, this does not preclude the possibility that some honorable men may be appointed to the Board of Governors. But the fact is that the Fed is specifically designed to operate independently of our government, as are nearly all other central banks. Some argue that the Fed promotes monetary stability. We saw the current head of the Bank of England, Eddie George, claim that this was the most important role of a central bank. In fact, the Fed's record of stabilizing the economy shows it to be a miserable failure in this regard. Within the first 25 years of its existence, the Fed caused three major economic downturns, including the Great Depression, and for the last 30 years has shepherded the American economy into a period of unprecedented inflation. Again, this is not some wild conspiracy theory. It's a well-known fact among top economists. As Nobel Prize winning economist Milton Friedman put it, the stock of money, prices, and output was decidedly more unstable after the establishment of the Federal Reserve System than before. The most dramatic period of instability in output was, of course, the period between the two wars, which includes the severe monetary contractions of 1920-21, 1929-33, and 1937-38. No other 20-year period in American history contains as many as three such severe contractions. This evidence persuades me that at least a third of the price rise during and just after World War I is attributable to the establishment of the Federal Reserve System, and that the severity of each of the major contractions, 1920-21, 1929-33 and 1937-38 is directly attributable to acts of commission and omission by the reserve authorities. Any system which gives so much power and so much discretion to a few men so that mistakes, excusable or not, can have such far-reaching effects is a bad system. It is a bad system to believers in freedom just because it gives a few men such power without any effective check by the body politic. This is the key political argument against an independent central bank. To paraphrase Clemenceau, money is much too serious a matter to be left to the central bankers. We must learn from our history before it is too late. Why can't politicians control the federal debt? Because all our money is created out of debt. Again, it's a debt money system. Our money is created initially by the purchase of U.S. bonds. The public buys bonds like savings bonds, the banks buy bonds, foreigners buy bonds, and when the Fed wants to create more money in the system, it buys bonds but pays for them with a simple bookkeeping entry which it creates out of nothing. Then this new money created by the Fed is multiplied by a factor of 10 by the banks thanks to the fractional reserve principle. 
So although the banks don't create currency, they do create checkbook money or deposits by making new loans. They even invest some of this created money. In fact, over $1 trillion of this privately created money has been used to purchase U.S. bonds on the open market, which provides the banks with roughly $50 billion in interest, risk-free, each year, less the interest they pay to some depositors. In this way, through fractional reserve lending, banks create over 90% of the money and therefore cause over 90% of our inflation. What can we do about all this? Fortunately, there's a way to fix the problem fairly easily, speedily, and without any serious financial problems. We can get our country totally out of debt in one to two years by simply paying off these U.S. bonds with debt-free